Good morning. It's good to be with you. Upon first studying today's text, I was struck by how ratcheted up they felt. I could feel my blood pressure rise. We are nearing the end of the church year, and the texts have an apocalyptic tone, and we are indeed anxious in our hearing. Yet the words offer such comfort, such clarity of God's complete love for us within the prediction of the destruction of the temple, if only we can endure the mayhem. If only we can endure the mayhem. A few weeks back, I hit a low point when a student from one of our Christian groups on campus came to me and said, Sharon, I do not want to help other religious groups to do their jobs better. It would seem disloyal to my own, to the tenets of my faith. I'm uncomfortable with this whole notion. My heart sunk. I thought, how do I get through to this student that reaching out to someone so very different than oneself is not a bad thing? It does not go against what God has always asked of us. And yet again, it appears to be the deal breaker the component of this holy interaction that we are working so hard to cultivate that stops everything cold. First, some context. This student came to me because of an exercise that the Interreligious Leadership Council had recently done together during one of their regular meetings. The IRLC is comprised, is comprised, interesting, <laughs> of the student leaders of many of the different religious groups on campus, and they meet every other week over supper to swap notes about what it takes to lead a group on campus and to take a stab at getting to know a bit more about each other, as well as the multiple faith traditions they represent. They're a remarkable group of dedicated leaders, some from large religious organizations with hundreds of members, and others from smaller groups who are just trying to keep momentum going with modest involvement. I am continually learning from them. Their perspective on the world we live in, on college life, on their spiritual journeys is astounding to me. They live in the midst of such pressure, such complexities. There is constant competition for their time, their energy, and their spirit from the demands of their intellectual pursuits and their social engagements. They take their obligations seriously, and they are incredibly thoughtful participants within this group. Which is why I was so troubled by this student's earlier statement. Had we hit an impermeable barrier? Was the hope for this simple endeavor an illusion? Was I asking too much of them? The exercise was one in which they were asked to talk together in pairs about the ups and downs of leading their respective groups. The goal was simply to exchange ideas and strategies for sustainable leadership for student religious organizations. The student who brought this concern to me was extremely thoughtful, and I knew it took some real courage to come and talk to me and honestly state how hard the exercise was. I admit I did feel at a loss for the right words in response. Sometimes the interreligious encounter takes us to the edges far away from where we are comfortable, and those edges can be very sharp. Around this time last year, I had the opportunity to hear a lecture by Mohammed Abu Nimer. Abu Nimer is a Palestinian from Israel and is an academic and an authority on conflict resolution particularly in the Middle East. He is also the director of the Peace Building and Development Institute in Washington, DC, and has led countless workshops on interreligious engagement in some of the most tension-filled parts of the world. He is a real straight talker and does not sugarcoat the reality of intergroup and specifically interreligious engagement. He has seen it all, has experienced deep defeat and despair along the way, and yet he's kept at it. During his lecture, he described for us one of the most compellingly true ways to understand this process that I have ever heard. He basically said that there are two ways we tend to think about interfaith dialogue and community building. The first is to imagine that you're looking through a window at a group of people in conversation 
from different and often differing perspectives from one another. As you look through this window, you are informed by their difference, you hear their perspectives, and you draw conclusions from it, but still you are not in it. Remember, you are looking through a window. It appears orderly and even inspiring. This is where most of us stand when it comes to encountering difference. We might seek out the window, be excited by its existence, and committed to regularly look through it, but that is it. We do not see ourselves in the room. Then there are those who have decided to walk through the door and, as Abu Niebuhr would probably put it, be in the mess. In the room of so many differences are people who are in real conflict with one another, but they are also in relationship with each other. They are trying to build on these relationships, and what they are learning about each other's tradition brings them more and more open to a point of transformation. Because they are willing to be in the room, and by design, by fate, they are there, this relationship with all the compromise and the promise can mean so much. It can be that transformative experience. This experience often leads to greater understanding, and in some cases, maybe even a certain kind of love. He has seen this time and again in his work, and he's realistic that this transformation cannot happen overnight. He is road-weary from the process, humbled by its weight, but persistent that it is essential to our existence. I have seen it too, and I have spoken about it often. When this transformation happens on a college campus, it's wonderful and life-changing. When it happens in the world, Though tougher to pull off, it can be even more fertile. Both Paul's letter and Luke's gospel invite us to vision our community and the very work of our faith without boundaries, without literal or figurative walls. These texts invite us to imagine ourselves in a kind of partnership with one another, one where we do not respond to violence or corruption with more of the same. They are asking that we resist the temptation to mimic the chaos around us. Considering the world we live in now, this feels quite daunting, at times even hopeless. I read a reflection recently on Luke's text that has an interesting take on all this. It described apocalyptic thinking as an anthropological category which served one function up until the time of Jesus. In every other manifestation of apocalyptic, the violence experienced by the community demands a violent response. But the community transfers their violence onto God. The reflection I read had a strong caution. As we allow God to bear our violence for us, we have then created a God who sanctifies our own. We make ourselves warrior reflections of our own projected violence. We make up holy armies to fight the wars of our created God. I was particularly struck by that last statement because it reveals a hidden, ugly truth within religious communities that we still encounter. We make up holy armies to fight the wars of our created God. Our created God. Jesus does not deny the reality of the disillusion of human culture that apocalyptic predicts. He does, however, separate it from God as a source or a violent solution. This is an embrace of a gospel that is more confident in God's solution because it is not just a larger vision of ours. Just this past Thursday, I had the privilege of convening a special dinner meeting with some Yale World Fellows, and again, the members of the Interreligious Leadership Council. The World Fellows Program is just finishing its ninth year here at Yale, and it brings together some of the most dynamic emerging leaders from around the world for a full semester. The Fellows interact with Yale and the New Haven community, and their presence is electrifying, challenging, inspiring, 
and oftentimes just plain eye-opening for many of us. This event last Thursday was no exception. One of the fellows who joined us was a young woman from Lebanon, and I invited her to simply tell her story. Her name was May Akel. She was a founding member of the Free Patriotic Movement, advisor to former Prime Minister and current member of Parliament, Mahal An, and was raised just outside of Beirut. May spoke to us about what it was like growing up with a Jewish mother and a Greek Orthodox father in Beirut. Her siblings, aunts and uncles, cousins and friends were Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. She was very matter-of-fact as she spoke, offering frank accounts of what it was like to live in the midst of such plurality of faiths and obvious religious tension, and yet navigate within it in such a way as to not feel alien from any one community. She grew up and was formed in the messy room Abu Nimer was describing. It was all her community, her blood. When she spoke about religious tensions around the world, she marveled at how it appeared to her that all the religious communities seemed to think that God was speaking only to them. At a young age, because of how she grew up, May came to the early conclusion that this was impossible and that God's voice could not be segregated by tradition. Rather, the traditions segregated God. God was theirs and no others. This made no sense to her, and she concluded that it probably made even less sense to God. I wondered what the student I mentioned earlier might be thinking. Had we hit yet another sharp edge? It's so very tempting to hide, to retreat within one's own religious community, suspicious of others, protective of one's own. I see it all the time. People fear that they are disloyal to their beliefs or to the others in their community if they are in appreciative relationship with others who live very different spiritual realities. To some, the Christian call to evangelize is understood to mean something that might indeed end in separation if one is not persuasive enough. It's not my intention to sound harsh. I'm trying to be anything but that. However, I am trying to illustrate that I think we are missing God's point. I suspect May is much closer to it. In our well-meaning attempts to be committed people of faith, we are often misappropriating our own agency with God. We cannot create the God that picks us, just us, over another. God was here before us. God created us. And as the psalmist writes, God will rule the world with justice and the peoples with fairness. Our task is to stay out of God's way. We must look from side to side, be in messy relationship with one another, do our work, and nurture this world we all share. Joan Chittister tells us, we must not be seduced by externals, even by the splendors of religion. Nothing but God is God, and it is God we must seek, not the rituals nor the riches of the faithful, but only the depth of faith. Right now, the university church is in the process of discerning its mission. It is committed to exploring together the depth of faith. This church, this assembly of strangers who are family in Christian relationship, is diligently trying to be active in its own formation. Whether we are packing lunches for chapel on the green, experimenting with a new liturgical element, supporting our neighbors through cooking at Columbus House, or are engaging in deep conversation with one another outside these walls, we are community, and we are trying to be open to what this means in a university setting where considerable demands are the norm in the midst of a city that needs can overwhelm at a time in history when we feel great distress on numerous fronts. As uncertain as these times may feel to us, the texts for today, written centuries ago, provide a much needed 
and timeless lens into what we must keep at the forefront of our thinking. We must endure the mayhem. We must not respond to chaos with more of the same. And again, we are called to sing a new song in a new way to our God who has worked wonders. The late John O'Donohue, Irish poet and teacher, offers a beautiful blessing for the start of a new day. So I will close with it as a loving hope for all of us who walk this earth from many families of faith as God's own beloved children. And for those of us here in this distinctly Christian community, as we look in anticipation toward a new year. Somewhere out at the edges, the night is turning and the waves of darkness begin to brighten the shore of dawn. The heavy dark falls back to earth and the freed air goes wild with light. The heart fills with fresh, bright breath, and thoughts stir to give birth to color. I arise today in the name of silence, womb of the word, in the name of stillness, home of belonging, in the name of the solitude of the soul and the earth. I arise today, blessed by all things, wings of breath, delight of eyes, wonder of whisper, intimacy of touch, eternity of soul, urgency of thought, miracle of health, embrace of God. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous, generous in love. Amen.